Ayer and Ivan Ladislavich, who will read and talk about the craft of narrative, about testing the limits of style, and so on and so forth. Uh, Rahul, you better check if you're audible. Am I audible? At all? This is better. Okay, so we have two amazing writers, as I said, Rukmini and Ivan, who will talk, but before that they'll read. And Rukmini is an eminent linguist and critic who did a PhD from Cambridge and has taught like all over the world in Delhi, Singapore, Seattle, Stanford, etc. Uh, she is widely recognized for her work in the areas of cognition and literary theory and has won awards including the Tata Scholarship, the Hornby Foundation Award and an honorary doctorate from the University of Antwerp. Her work's also taught on courses in universities and she's currently a professor of linguistics and English at the IIT Delhi. She also happens to be an award-winning poet with three books of poetry to her credit and has been described by Keki Daruwala as the author of the first significant volume of postmodern poetry written by an Indian. Her first novel, Mad Girl's Love Song, came out in 2013 and she'll be reading and talking about that. Uh, Ivan Ladislavich is a South African novelist and a short story writer of Croatian origin and is widely regarded as one of South Africa's foremost writers. He works as an editor and is the author of the highly praised novels The Folly, The Restless Supermarket, The Exploded View and most recently Double Negative which he'll be reading from as well as the non-fiction Portrait with Keys which he'll also read segments from. Uh, he has published recently two books that include artistic illustrations as well and has won various awards including the Olive Shriner Prize, the Cannes Literary Award, the Sunday Times Fiction Prize and the Sunday Times Award for Nonfiction. Both Rukmini and Ivan have been tagged with the descriptor postmodern. And what the work has in common is an intellectual rigor and ambition combined with verbal and structural playfulness. The works are also in different ways polyphonic in that they bring to bear a variety of resources and registers, history, critical theory, fantasy, non-fiction, fiction, and even images to illum illuminate the central themes and concerns. So that's uh, the introduction. Uh, Ivan will read first and he'll tell you a little about the work as well. Uh, good evening, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here and to share a platform with, uh, with Rukmini. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to be reading a short passage from okay. I'm going to be reading a short passage from my book, Portrait with Keys, uh, which is a book about Johannesburg. It's a book in uh, about 140 short texts uh, on different aspects of city life. They were written uh, in a period of about eight years or so, uh, and published in sequences of about 20 texts um, before I finally assembled them into, into a, a book. Uh, the book is about uh, many aspects of living in Johannesburg, uh, walking, friendship, um, the, the kinds of people that you meet on the streets and so on. But it's also one of the strongest themes happens to be that of crime and security or insecurity as I like to think of it. Johannesburg is a very divided city. It's living with the consequences of apartheid. Um, it's a rather dangerous city or it has that reputation certainly. And Johannesburgers are very much concerned with their safety, with the safety of their property. We have an immense uh, uh, private security industry and to give you some uh, indication of that at the last count we had something like 400,000 private security guards um, in a country with about 50 million people 
this is a private uh, security army, if you like, that is very much bigger than the national police force. Uh, fortunately, they are not all under a single company or a single banner. They are divided between thousands of companies. But nevertheless, the, the scale of that uh, private uh, um, industry gives you some sense of how much insecurity there is in the country, how much anxiety people feel about their personal safety. And so one of the strange aspects of living in Johannesburg is that you deal constantly with security guards. You'll find them outside shops, outside uh, office parks, outside um, private residences. Um, and you develop a kind of odd sometimes amusing, sometimes frustrating relationship with these people who control your movement around the city. There's a strong stand in my book which is dealings with security guards and I thought I would uh, read a section that's about what happens when nice middle-class people like me have to organize a, a party and one of, the, one of the things you have to do is arrange security for your guests. So I'm going to read that section. And I hope I can see the slide. We have left the arrangement, sorry. We have left the security arrangement day party until the last minute, resisting the imposition of it hoping the problem will resolve itself. Once your responsibilities as host extended no further than food and drink and a bit of mood music, now you must take steps to the safety of your guests and their property. I think it's irresponsible of us to have a dinner party at all, I say to Minky, my partner. There should be a municipal bylaw that only people with long driveways and big dogs are allowed to entertain. We should call the whole thing off. It'll be fine, she says, just stop obsessing about it. The last time we had people over, I had to keep going inside to check that their cars were still there. It spoiled my evening. We'll get a guard, she says. She phones the armed response people. It's too late. Guards are booked. But they recommend the Academy of Security, where trainees are registered for on-the-job experience. Yes, they do supply security guards for single functions. A dinner party, can do. That will be the half-shift deal, unless you want him to stay past midnight and pay the full shift rate. Being inexperienced, the guard cannot be armed, of course, but he will be under constant supervision. They could arrange an armed guard from another company, probably, but at such short notice, it will be more expensive, you understand. So we settle for inexperienced, unarmed, half shift. The security costs more than the food, I say, and he's still an apprentice. We should have gone to a restaurant. The, 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 the apprentice security guard is called Bongi. The apprentice, the apprentice security guard is called Bongi. So far, he has only acquired the top half of a uniform, a navy blue tunic that is too short in the sleeve. The check pants and down at heel shoes are clearly his own. By way of equipment, he has a large silver torch and a panic button hanging around his neck. My theory is that he is earning the uniform item by item as payment or incentive. After six months or so, he'll be fully qualified and fully clothed. I knew this was a bad idea, I said to Minky. He's just a kid. Bongi is standing under a tree on the far side of the road. He looks vulnerable and lonely. It is starting to drizzle. 
Minky takes him an umbrella from a stand at the door, the grey and yellow one with the handle in the shape of a toucan, which once belonged to her dad. With this frivolous thing in his hand, Bongi looks even more poorly equipped to cope with the streets. This is unforgivable, I say. This is a low point. I'd rather live in a flat than do this. What difference would that make, she says. She always sees through my rhetoric. People have still got to park their cars somewhere. A complex then. I'd rather live in a complex. Whoops. Whoops. I'd rather live in some place with secure parking. The guests begin to arrive. Bongi waves the torch around officiously and then stands on the pavement under the toucan umbrella, embarrassed. When dinner is served, Minky takes out a plate of food and a cup of coffee. This poor kid's starving, she says when she comes back. Excusing myself from the table on the pretext of fetching more wine from the spare room, I sneak outside and gaze at him from the end of the porch. He's squatting on the curb, with the plate between his feet on the tar, eating voraciously. He's a sitting duck, I say to Minky in the kitchen when we're dishing up seconds. What is he expected to do if an armed gang tries to steal one of the cars, God forbid, throw the panic button at them? The whole arrangement is immoral, and especially our part in it. Our friends are insured anyway. If someone steals Branko's car, he'll get another one. What if the kid gets hurt while we're sitting here feeding our faces and moaning about the crime rate? I think he'll have seconds. With a plate of chicken under his belt and another in prospect, Bongi is looking better. We exchange a few words. He comes from a farm near Marikana, out near the Machalisberg, and he's been in Johannesburg since June. His uncle found him this job. His uncle has been a full-time security for five years. He looks quite pleased with himself. Perhaps he's thinking this is not such a bad job after all. But we cannot see it that way. At 10.30, Minky calls him inside to watch the cars from the porch over the wall. When the supervisor arrives an hour later, there's a hullabaloo. You've got to maintain standards, he says, especially when you're training these guys. You can't have them getting soft on the job. That's it, we say to one another afterwards. No more dinner parties, never again. Shall we alternate? Shall we alternate? If you like. So, uh, if we might need. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here, first of all, with Ivan and with Rahul and all of you. I don't think a Darbar Hall could be pet put to better use than to have it as a literature darbar, even at this stage in the evening's proceedings. I have to say, as Rahul told you, that although uh, I, I write books and I've done poetry and uh, five books of criticism, three volumes of poetry, I'm really a novice uh, at at the novel, so uh, so, one, so uh, when I wrote this novel, or when uh, you know I embarked on it, one of the things which I asked myself is, well, why am I doing this crazy thing, and how does it relate to the other stuff? that I've written, the criticism, the poetry, and uh, just the thoughts which I have always buzzing in my head. And the first thing that struck me is that, you know, maybe what, what joins these things together is simply uh, unreadability. I'm the kind of queen of unreadability. But it could be that there's something more. And what I think has been an obsession with my writing has been the kind of boundary between literature and 
emotion. That is, I ask the question in all my writing, how is it that forms of fiction, which are obviously false, arouse at and hold us so long for, uh, and have down the ages? And I hope that the, these questions will come up in discussion. Uh, what struck me in writing, starting embarking on the novel, is that I discovered something which um, maybe people um, discover much, much younger, which is that the novel is a really a capacious form. It encompasses the whole, it can encompass the whole universe. And so it's a good place to situate dialogues between criticism and poetry and um, uh, a history and all those things. So in many ways this novel is experimental and hybrid and its particular theme is a theme that has come up in the couple of sessions I've attended over and over again which is the kind of uh, uh, schizophrenic love that we have for literature and particularly, no, not literature, but for the English language and how we obsess about it. In Ivan's reading just now, there was a character who said, um, you know, it's going to be all right, don't obsess about it. But in my novel, the central character, who's a young girl who's got schizophrenia, but is tremendously traumatized because her mother has killed herself. She doesn't know why her mother has killed herself, and she thinks that the answer lies. She herself is quite crazy and has inherited schizophrenia. The novel has doctor's notes throughout, and she feels that the answers to the many things which are troubling her lie in these English books that she finds in the convent library. Now, she's a convent girl, and like me, she learned her English in a convent. Um, and, you know, until I went to England, I didn't realize that the English I'd learned in the convent was somebody else's language. I came to realize this, that this was so troublesome and contentious, this business of ownership of language. And now, of course, it's there in all discussions that we have. So what we're exploring, uh, what I'm exploring this is, in this novel is cultural schizophrenia as well as real schizophrenia. So I'm going to be unconventional. There is a novel, but I'm going to read uh, from the computer. And this is partly because um, I'm mixing up uh, poetry and, so I hope this comes on. Screen's not on. Oh, yeah. Is that? My screen's not coming on though. I wonder why. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Mm. Yeah, it should come on simply by tapping. It has gone to sleep. Well, we do have the novel, so why is it that this is... Maybe we put it off. Yeah, there we go. Uh, no, but it's going... Yeah. Why don't we just... Um, there's a poem at the beginning. I am sorry. Why is it not coming on? Uh, yes, I could just... Yeah, um, if you just, uh, excuse me, could you just put it on and off again? Okay, so, uh, so I'll just read from the beginning of the novel. Um, and in this part of the novel, um, Uh, she is uh, talking, she, the novel begins with the question, what's love, which is an emotional question. Okay, so it's working now. Oh, great. Oh. 
Okay, so I want to begin with reading you a short poem. The poem is not part of the novel, but it is important, because, important to introduce it because I realized that poetry constituted the pegs on which I um, hung the novel. So the poem is called None and it's just half a minute long. When I think of nothingness, I think of her. Beneath the million pleated uprump skirt, system of pulleys, culling supports of air, Sister Maria Blandina Joseph, is she there? Her designer scissors flicker in among the reds, and purples flare and vanish, cold as a death. Tricked out in her sorcerer's garb, imagination's superior agent, the sexless nun, wins all always, or none. So uh, the, the, the background is um, a nunnery. And uh, the first uh, session is where um, uh, is about the uh, the first section is about um, Sylvia Plath, who asked the question, and the heroine is imagining that she's part of Sylvia's life. What's love anyway? Sylvia asked on the night of her death, her wide mouth curving. I did not answer her, and then she entered the moonlight, and she died. Who killed her? Who killed my mother? Who killed Jahangir the turkey? You can read the answers in this notebook, Paris book. Sylvia never looked at me when she asked her questions, never. But that night, it was different. The moon had sharpened her voice, and it drove something into my heart. A stake, she said. Or maybe she said snake. Anyway, I was cold, and Sylvia had no time for me. She was going on a hunt, she said, to set traps, traps for poems. A poem was a beast, she said a furred, tawny creature in a cage of words. It was a wild mess of scribbles and lines and harsh talon scratches on paper. Later, the bars would have to be strengthened, the snarling creature tamed, and the poem fitted onto a daytime page where strangers' eyes would come to peer and stubby fingers point. All these things this bucolic ghastliness, she told me she had schooled herself for. What she could not stand, she said, still not looking at me, was the nothingness. The nights when Daddy or Blake or someone stood at the edge of the woods and picked off the beasts long before they got to her. On these nights, she felt she was the one being hunted. It was then that her impossible questions came to her, and she'd repeat over and over in a hysteria of unknowing, what's love? What's love anyway? Now that is, a, 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 the, a, you know, a, could have been written by anyone, anywhere in the world. It is not really a distinctive Indian voice, but the girl whom I'm talking about, who obsesses about these poets, is brought up in a convent in Bihar, in a small town in Bihar, and uh, she, here she's describing, because she's you know, she's been dictate, the voices in her head dictate that she should describe her town. She describes it. And this is what she says. Temki is my town. It has a level crossing, a girl's convent, Biscuit Baba's world-renowned meditation as, uh, ashram. When I came back from England, cured of my madness forever, I heard a story. One of the little beggar boys who was always hanging round the ashram has his hands crushed 
by the Baba's supporters and the police for trying to steal a big pile of biscuits they kept in the Baba's tent. Of course, the Baba had no idea what had been done to the boy. He was observing his monrath at the time and nobody wanted to disturb him. But in the end, the Baba came to know and he acted at once. He arranged for the boy to have the best hospital care and when he recovered, both his hands had been amputated. He was even given a job by the Baba. His job was to guard the pile of biscuits he'd coveted. He had no hands now, so there was no question of his touching the biscuits. And once in a while, the Baba would be extra kind. He'd order someone to throw a biscuit in the boy's direction. Uh, for the boy had been expertly trained by the ashramites to catch biscuits in his open mouth like a dog. Naturally, the boy became the 10 star attraction. On Thursdays, the Baba's th date for public darshan. When he wasn't catching biscuits and coins in his mouth, this boy never ceased to sing the praises of the Baba until one day, one day, he just ran away without a backward glance and set up his own holy business in Madhepura. This was a story about disloyalty and how hard it is to know the heart of another. Many other things have happened while I was away and I have written them all down. And now I'm almost done. And uh, today I don't need the word so badly anymore because I'm back in the convent where it all began. And I see, I look up at the dawning light now and I notice something. A nosy, noisy pigeon and a tuntunia bird have taken over the windowsill and are belting out a chorus I recognize. Sylvia wrote these words, this poem for me. She called it her mad girl's love song. I shut my eyes and all the world drops dead. I lift my lids and all is born again. I think I made you up inside my head. But these birds are shameless, Beshram. They mix up Sylvia's poems with my question, with her question, stick in all sorts of bits in between and make up this crazy hodgepodge. Anyway, anyway, me ka khau ka piu ka leke pardes jau de jabba. I dreamed you bewitched me into bed. And anyway, anyway, what's love anyway? Their twittering makes it sound like it's the easiest question in the world. Let Afi awake, I tell them, you ridiculous avians, and you will have your answer. And then I turn towards Afi, my love, though I can hardly bear to look in his direction. That stone slab look of him, flat dead, that awful bluish O in the fish mouth gaping in his bandaged, faceless face. Alone with Afi, in the unforgiving light of the con convent, I know I am in need of a miracle. And I am not insane. The most incurable madness in the world is to live in hope when there is no reason for it. Afi, too, was beaten to a pulp not too long ago, and now it's a matter of touch and go whether he lives or dies. Not that the Baba has anything to do with the matter. Someone else was guilty, and I am going to find out who. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan and Rukmini, for uh, the wonderful reading. And, well, the session brief says you ought to talk about style and the nature of postmodernism. And I want to ask you both about that. Uh, what, how, how do you see uh, the postmodern in your work? What, what does that even mean now? And, uh, 
yeah, what does it mean for you and what does it mean in general terms? How do you, how do you see that affecting your work? Um, re relatively early in my writing career, I was accused of being a magic realist. And I, I, I thought it couldn't get worse, but um, a few years later I was accused of being a postmodernist. Um, so, what do I think of postmodernism? I personally have always found uh, postmodernism easier to understand in certain relation other to disciplines and certain other practices than in relation to literature. It's quite clear to me what postmodernism is in architecture, for instance. The certain kinds of practices of the, the postmodernist architects, the sorts of quotations they, they did from the history of architecture, a particular sort of re rejection of modernism, um, makes sense to me. I, I, I understand the term. In relation to literature, I've always found it an extremely vague um, concept. I've never quite understood what gets caught up in that label. Um, I believe that in many ways it's a, it's a marketing label. I believe it's um, uh, uh, an easy catch-all category for a lot of writers who are in fact quite different and do quite different things. Um, at this particular festival, I've heard on several platforms a particularly s simplified version of postmodernism presented uh, in which it's something like books with big ideas and not, not much else in them. And um, I think that's an extremely reductive way of looking at it. I think that some of the most interesting books for me, written by postmodernists, um, are extremely subtle books that deal with the nature of, uh, of uh, story making, with how truth, truth is constructed in the, in the making, in, in narrative. It deals with con deal, they books that deal with consumer society, uh, they deal with particular forms of alienation that people feel in the contemporary world. Um, I think whether you think postmodernism is a dirty word or not depends on who you classify as a postmodernist. My postmodernists are uh, Calvino, um, are Georges Perec, are Milan Kundera, um, and these are, are Don DeLillo in at least some of his work. And to me, these are writers who have done extraordinary things. They, it's true that they work with concepts in their work. It's not true that their books are simply big ideas and nothing else. So that's a response, I suppose. You want a response from me? Okay. So what I think is that I tend to see a historical movement like postmodernism filtered through another lens, uh, which is the one which came up in this bit of writing, which is post-colonialism. And I see uh, myself, if I see myself as a post-anything writer, I would say colonialism filtered again through English is one of our, um, our uh, central issues because it really uh, uh, to, uh, sort of mediates our relationship between institutions and language, between power and language. So when I think of postmodernism, uh, as it is articulated by philosophers and writers and so on, it tends to be about hybridity, difference, uh, this polyphonic buzz, the ability to mix things up and so on. But when I think of post-colonialism, it is actually not about difference or difference, but about indifference, structures of indifference, the way in which the stance of impartiality, the st stance of the English language means that a lot, there are lots of forms of language and in, uh, um, language and expression from which the populace at large is kept away. So I think 
the indifference difference that is very uh, pertinent to writers tr trying to negotiate the boundaries between modernism and uh, postmodernism and postcolonialism. Uh, and I think that um, one of the things that we uh, constantly do in looking at these two movements is that postmodernism, in a sense, offers us an aesthetic. But post-colonialism asks us to look at an ethics. And in our novels, there is this tension, this struggle. And I don't believe, really, that literature is sociology. And in most post-colonial countries, what happens is that you have to describe, and many writers have said this, uh, in a sense, the grimmest aspects of the society. The, you have to describe what is a, a kind of exotic other. And uh, this is one of the burdens which post-colonialism uh, uh, puts you under. And I believe that the writer has in many ways a task to perform in interpreting post-modernism under post-colonial conditions. So I think that, you know, and what I mean by that is something very simple. You know, we learn English literature and then um, we think we know the country and I really when I went to England I thought well you know this looks familiar Cambridge all these towers and so on and so forth and then I went and i had been told that if you go shopping in England this was many years ago you have to go to a department store and what you have to do is to put things into the bag and pay at the end. What I did not know about modern Britain is that you have to put things in a set bag, not your own bag. And so what I found was that there was a man following me around and I said, that's fine, okay. Uh, and then at the end, of, of, of when I was going out and stopping in front of the counter, he said to me, Miss, what are you going to do with all those things? And I said, pay for them. And he said, you are the oddest shoplifter I've ever seen. Have you not, do you have no idea how to shoplift? And I realized that I was in this peculiar Kafkaesque postmodern situation where I did not know the post of modernity in England. I had learned it through books, through reading. And I did know in a way that, uh, and I got the knowledge, you have to pay at the end, you don't have, to. but nobody told me there are those carts and you have to put things into those carts. So there are these very, very thin lines of cultural difference as well as the fact that we are in societies where you know, you might be regarded as a shoplifter. You've come from outside, you don't know your way around. And I think so in some ways, this business about post-colonialism, post-modernism will take a lot more writing and sussing out, and some of that might be within uh, the domains of talking about languages, which are my obsession. Thank you. Thank you, Rukmini. Yeah, uh, I think we can open this up to the audience now for comments, thoughts, questions. The last two sessions that I attended, um, I was uh, fortunate enough to listen to the uh, writings by the authors themselves. I was just wondering, uh, do you think that uh, uh, an audio book in which you know you uh, read out your own uh, things would be reaching to more and more uh, um, people out? Um, do you think that uh, an audio book in which uh, uh, the author itself uh, is uh, reading the works uh, would be like you know reaching out to more and more people and you know enlightening more and more people about uh, how beautifully people like you are writing <laughs> so
so the question is, do you think, you know, the experience of listening to a writer or a poet is quite different from struggling your way through the book. But when Ivan and I were talking yesterday, we were saying that we would never go to a prose reading because it's so much better to be with the book and lift the pages, but, uh, you know, read, get into the book without necessarily having to uh, talk to an audience. I think these two experiences are very different. Um, you know, the experience of reading a book on your own and the experience of interacting with an audience. I would never have got to know you unless we had this interaction. What I want to say one thing is that the oral mode is very powerful in India. I think it has been sidelined by the literature, by the written culture, and I think that that's at the heart of your question, because I think we are great talkers, you know, and that's what we naturally do even cognitively. So I think it is important to have festivals or meeting places of this type, because I think that that gives us a, 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 an in into orality which our universities often block out. I often tell my students that language which I study is 50 or 60 or maybe 75,000 years old, but writing is only 5,000 years old. It is an in unstable medium but very powerful and we may be moving back to oralities so I think that's a good question about the video video book which I think we need to think about There's another response well, I think yeah I, I, I'm interested that you say that because um, I also come from a culture in which um, the oral tradition is very um, strong um, and I suppose for me the the, the key thought here is that um, storytelling is an, is an oral practice, but I don't regard myself as a storyteller. I regard myself very much as a writer. And so I'm confronted, which isn't to say that stories and narrative is not important to me. It's just that my central impulse is to produce um, things which are, which are there to be read. So I, I have a certain dilemma the book that I read from is in, is in 140 short texts. The meaning of the book emerges as much from the orchestration of those texts, from the interplay of meanings between the texts, as it does from any particular story. I had to choose a piece from the book, and so I chose a fairly self-contained uh, story. But it doesn't really convey the essence of my book. The meaning of my book emerges in the interplay of all of these pieces together. It's about the reader actually discovering patterns in that broad range of 140 pieces. And so by performing my work, which is part of what we have to do as contemporary writers, in a sense I undercut the basic premise of my book. Hello. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, so, it, wow. I need to. I need to work on this. Just give me a second. Uh, I th I thought it was really interesting to listen to the two of you together because uh, when you were talking about postmodernism and some of the best artists that you've ever read in that category, you mentioned Milan Kundera. Uh, at the same time, you kind of took it down a post-colonial sort of. Uh, lineage which you could trace back to all the great Indian authors of the 80s, maybe Vikram Seth, uh, Rajdi, Naipaul, that entire lot. Uh, so my, my question is based on this, if, is, it, is it a little bit of cramping your style, the, the fact that your postmodernism has to be defined? Because Kundera is somebody who lived through occupation for a great part of his life. He, w he saw the Prague Spring, he had to move out of his home country, he never really went back. But he never wrote with that, with that in mind for me. I mean, even though he, he mentions Prague incessantly and he mentions where he came from, he doesn't really let that get involved in his writing as, uh, from the point of view of identity. Uh, so is, is the Indian question that important to you as a writer? 
is the post colonial aspect more important in some ways than the post modern aspect to you I think that one should not uh, a seek to define a term like postmodernism or any of these large abstract terms uh, in a comprehensive way. One can only do so through a particular angle, a particular theoretical question. I, uh, you know, and so uh, for I, I only said that because you know, in India, it's pos it's impossible if you write in English, but only if you write in English to engage with the question of postmodernism. And what I suggested is that writers like Rushdie and all the others who, who post-80s writers um, really did something clever. They produced theory as literature. That is to say, and this is a very old thing because I think uh, literature theorizes the world for us. And I suggested that what they did, people like Derek Walcott and so on, was to do a kind of a hyphen and hooks kind of engagement with history to try to recover, you know, a, a singing voice from criticism. And they took over. They, so I have several features of this sensuous theory, which I believe post-colonial post writers practice, which, has, which is constantly in dialogue with post-modern theory. But you know, I think we also need to get away from the post. I don't think we should be asking questions as like, which is more important? Because one is an artistic, you know, response to the war. Another is a response to recovering uh, selves after amnesia. I think writers do theorize the world, and they may do so taking bits and pieces from theory, taking bits and pieces from the world, and uh, to make people emotionally engaged, which is what I was talking about emotionally. For me, the question for all theory, if it comes to the psychology of the mind, is when does language break down? I think postmodernists and postcolonialists are all confronting. The, for example, if somebody is in terrible grief, terrible pain, sometimes you do not find the words to console that person. It is not this wonderful literary thing. You may just use touch. You may put your arm around that person. From that moment of contact, springs many of our most basic psychological questions. And I think literature answers those questions perhaps as satisfactorily in many ways as um, philosophy or psychology. I don't think we ought to get too stuck on postmodernism, postcolonialism, the opposition, and so on and so forth. Ours is to explore, you know, and try, seek to understand. That's our task. I think this sounds a bit namby-pamby, but I assure you, it is a matter of craft. May, may I pick up on uh, what you're saying? Um, I particularly like the idea that one of the potentials of postmodern writing is that it introduces, or in fact reintroduces, um, the idea of, cri of, of criticism, for instance, into fiction. Now, when I was thinking of Kundera, for instance, um, I think his Book of Laughter and Forgetting, which is, I think, one of the most influential uh, texts of that period, about 82, 83, I suppose, one of the things that he did in that book was to, was to reintroduce the essay into fiction. And I say reintroduce because he himself points out in, in his um, writing elsewhere on the novel um, that, in fact, this was a potential of fiction before the rise of the, of the realist or, or, or the rise of the modern novel. So he goes back to Diderot, for instance, and finds the same potential in, in fact, the pre-modern novel. And I think in some ways where this debate is all is skewed to some extent is that a lot of what is regarded as postmodern fiction is in fact fiction that returns to a tradition that predates the, the modern novel. And I'm thinking of writers like Lawrence Stern 
or, or, or uh, the Shandy book, which is, uh, I guess, an obvious example. But in a, in a way, it's, 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 a, it's a fact that, the, the, that the, for many years, the realist novel was the dominant form, the modernist novel in the 20th century, the dominant form. But in fact, there were novels in the very early um, period of, of prose, extended prose writing, which operated in a different way. And I think that's one of the gifts of postmodern writing is that it reactivates those kinds of potentials of, yeah. Uh, Ma'am, uh, ma you very well said that sometimes we fail to get the words to express our feelings, right? Uh, as far as your novel is concerned, I think it's a hitlerious blend of poetry and fic fiction. I hope I'm not wrong. And is it postmodernist? I hope you're not getting me. Uh, your novel seems to be a Hitlerious blend of poetry and fiction. Uh, yeah, Hitlerious. Yeah. Uh, I hope I'm not wrong. And uh, second thing, uh, is it postmodernist phenomena of writing a novel with a blend of poetry and fiction? Well, um, I think you may call it a postmodernist phenomenon, but for me, it was a natural thing to do. I wasn't sure whether you said glorious, which is what I want to hear, or inglorious, which I think I heard. What did you say? Glorious. Hitler, Hitler, Hitlerious Hit blend. Hitlerious. Yeah. Wow. That's scary. I don't know whether I meant to be hit glorious, but I think what I did, I think one thing which is very important for me is that uh, this form, this blended form, I, I, I uh, think allows us to enter history from a different perspective. This novel of mine, where, you know, I've been writing poetry for a long time, but this novel of mine was an uh, is actually part of a trilogy where I'm looking at this whole business of writing in English and how one can track back our love for English so the f uh, so all of them involve historical figures. So it's these are poets, but in the novel. Uh, which is good, so my, my trilogy will spiral back. And the serious questions are the relationship for me, not between necessarily between various literary genres like poetry and prose and so on, but also uh, between the dialogue between history and uh, writing, because we, if you introduce historical figures like Plath and Blake and so on, one of the things is that you can do in fiction, which I assure you you can't do in critical theory, is to put words into people's mouths. And I think, you know, so this business about language breaking down, which we talked about earlier, this form, I realize, gives me the chance to keep on putting words into Ga so my other novel has Gandhi and Nehru, it's set in Bihar, Gandhi and uh, Tagore, and it's set in Bihar. Again, the debate is over whether the great Bihar earthquake in the town of Temki really was a punishment to the people because they were practicing casteism, or uh, was it uh, not a punishment but a coincidence, uh, or just an incident, and this was the position Tagore held. Uh, the point was that I can enter those debates through fiction. As a historian, I would be you know, entering that debate differently. So I don't think it's only Hitlerian, it is in a way hist Larian or hist glorious because history is a very important part of a post-colonial perspective and I think one ought to retain one sense of humor at the end so thank you for hit glorious I like that I think we we may need to uh, finish there actually if that's all right did you want to close or yeah uh, 
So we seem to be done here, uh, and we're out of time. But thank you both for a great postmodern session and incredible reading. I wish I could hear more.